compañeros, welcome to another edition of the Secret Life of Potters podcast. I am Carlos El Chacon, your host, and this is episode 255. We only have We're one so more close to integer overflow. Yeah, so the close. tiny int overflow. <laughs> yeah. Yes, hopefully you're working on your data types. Uh, I'll have to uh, make sure we talk about our podcast hosting company. Make sure they are ready. No, right? I'm, re- I'm ready for episode negative 255. It's going to be great. <laughs> 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 two's compliment. Why do we store this with two's compliment? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So then the, then the real episode will be negative one, right? That That's when yeah. things will get interesting. Um, okay. So this is episode 255, and we are joined once again by Kevin Martin uh, from Emergent Software. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so again, if you, in episode, uh, 254, we talked about another one of your, um, uh, I'm going to call it community, right? Community focused, uh, uh, processes, um, SP develop this one today. In today's episode, we are going to talk about, uh, SP crud gen, right? And this is going to be another, uh, kind of interesting, uh, so another interesting community uh, store procedure that you've put together to help people go faster, right, when it comes to development. And so I'm interested to uh, to get into this with you. Okay, but before we do that, I know Kevin's super interested. He's, he's, he is ready to get into it. But before we do that, I'd like to give uh, a couple of shout outs. I've got shout outs for Andrea Fuller, Heidi Bassett, Sarah Grant, Steve Midkiff, Kevin Espinal, Ashley A. Oswald, Justin Barr, Robert Carson, Ralph C. Dewey, Jay Yancey Jr., McKinley Tucker Jr., Amy Howe, Butch Brookshire, Robert Sakovich, Audrey Turner, Joanna Hewitson, uh, El- Elaine Abad, uh, Barkindo Bin Uthan. Uthanmen, Marcio Rodriguez Maya, and Joe Helliston. Joe Helston. So thank you, compañeros, for giving us a little love on social media uh, or wherever those interactions may be happening. We appreciate you reaching out and uh, and giving us a little shout out there. Okay, so Kevin, right? Another uh, another labor of love here. So you have um, processes. You have queries that need to get written um, that do some of the, of the basic stuff, right? So CRUD, right? A lot of, again, developers are, right? I need to be able to, you know, update, delete, create, you know, what have you. And sometimes that can be a, a little bit tedious. Um, so you're like, you know what? I can help here. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, we've got SP CRUD Gen. So take us through, right? Introduce this to us, um, maybe elaborate a little bit more than I did on uh, on what's it do for folks and uh, and how it can be helpful to them. Yeah. Um, so the genesis of this was, um, uh, you know, me being, you know, a software developer, but, you know, a data guy at heart constantly for my entire career. Uh, the CTO kind of co-owner of the company also same upbringing, a lot of data centric database um, heavy type of development. Um, a lot of what people want to do these days is do a lot of ORMs and a lot of dynamic SQL. Um, a lot of times though, I'm, you know, some of my consulting engagements is with clients who have built ORMs and and they have their code and it's just generating just some really not very optimal, you know, SQL in the background. So, um, what I ended up doing is building this, um, you know, SP CRUD gen generator to help out a lot of like our software developers and community software developers or database people where it's going to generate, you know, not just your create, read, update, and delete. Like those are pretty easy. You can just like, there's a lot of things that generate those. You can type them in anywhere. Very easy to write, copy, paste, rinse, repeat. Sure. Uh, uh, but, you know, I've, I even have like upsert patterns and, and different type of things. So there's 11 different stored procedures that SP CRUD gen generates um, from the basic to probably one of the most complicated queries that anybody could do is like writing 
like dynamic SQL for like kitchen sink searches, you know, cause you're going to have somebody that says, well, I just want one search. I want one page and I can search by 200 parameters and, and I want <laughs> ands and ors and contains and greater thans and, you know, all these different type of things in there. Um, so what I ended up doing is that was like kind of the, one of the main things that I wanted to get into SP crud gen was this dynamic SQL generator, right? Uh -huh. So you can, you can point this at a table or at a view. If it's at a table, it's going to use, you know, all the foreign keys to crawl those tables and generate, a, you know, dynamic SQL where you can pass in all the, all the kitchen sink type of parameters and have all the different, you know, everything that we know we can add in a where clause, a software developer could add that as a dropdown to be able to search on it. And it's just going to you know, dynamically create all that SQL server for you. And it's going to be fast, assuming you have like, you know, good indexes and stuff on there. So right. um, we Which you don't right? use DSP develop, find that out and then come back and, yep. uh, <laughs> yeah. and run that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so that, so that is like the one I end up usually speaking on and giving presentations on is, is the, the, you know, the kitchen sink, Swiss army knife, catch all queries. They've had tons of names, you know, over the years of what people have called them. And, and we have at our company, we have software developers that just go in, they create the view because if you have a little bit more complex joins or you want to put different columns together, you could either come back and, you know, and, and index that view, but you know, we haven't gotten enough data you know, to ever get to that point where it, that's uh, been a perform problem. So we don't even do that. So, so like our software developers, they will go create a view and call it like uh, customer details or something and, and be able to just point SP develop and say, just generate the kitchen sink for that. And it creates thousands and thousands of lines of code and they have their, their software code, their ORM, they're using Dapper on this project. So they built all so you can go in and just say add parameter. You can pick from the drop down to pick like this column. I want greater than or less than or in between or all the different type of stuff that you can do. And and SQL, the SQL stored procedure, search stored procedure handles that for them. And we haven't been able to throw enough. Like we have 150 million records at it. I've, I've tested it um, uh, with with like 500 million, but I ran out of space on my, you know, on my, you know, NVMe. But. Um, and we haven't been able to make it go slow yet. So on a local database, it's sub second queries for everything that you're searching on Azure. It's a little bit more difficult because it's based on the DTU, the tier on like what you can get for, for like response back And one second is as fast as we can get even a premium or business critical tier with like, you know, uh, like eight or 16 different V cores, cause it's going to go parallel on there. So, right. um, it has been performant and it has been working great. And we, we use this in production for our company that generates these stored procedures for us. Yeah. So any, um, now again, right. So we're, we're data folks, right. And, and I, I love, right. That you've gotten the marriage. I'm going to call it that together where you are as the, you know, the data person, you're like, Hey, developers, right. Use this thing. Or here's a tool that you can, that you can do that. I guess I'm you know, to talk politics uh, perhaps for a minute. You know, if, if I'm a, if I'm a data person, how do I go in and start suggesting, hey, developers, stop using the you know, the ORM tool that you're used to using, and let's do it this way, right? Is what's the you know? And that was the, in there, right? Yeah, and that was initially on the start of the project. I mean, we you know we would have lunch and learns just to kind of talk. You know, the data team talking. And not even lunch and learns. It was um, more shop talks that we have um, where we talk about like just let's take everybody's temperature. How comfortable are you guys writing, you know, stored procedures, even basic CRUDs, let alone dynamic SQL, right? That is, is you know, you know, safe and performant and stuff. And and a lot of them were like, we can do it. But once, you know, it gets to be a little bit more difficult, it, it's it, you know, that's when we need like somebody from the data team's help to help and stuff like that. So. So it, you know, it's it's kind of we talk about it. We got the buy-in from from all the other software developers, and they're like, yeah, okay, we could probably use some help. And that's where like doing just your CRUD stuff is going to work for there on you know your your you know line of business application. That reporting is going to be something completely different, you know. 
um, you know, writing, you know, writing up. Usually that's when the, the people from the data team come in and write your TPS reports or something like that. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's a lot of communication back and forth. There was a lot of hesitation with it of, you know, a lot of them want to use the ORM and just dynamically, you know, generate a lot of these queries and stuff like that. Because right. so, you get uh, to stay in the same that's, tool, right? That's always the, yeah. you know, you have, you have to, you have, when you have to jump, right? I can see that being kind of a, a pain point. Yep. Yep. Right. But I would imagine that if on the flip side, if you can show the, uh, the benefit, like, hey, well, you know, the stuff that I'm generating <laughs> works, right? Then, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That, that might yeah, be a, a lot yeah, of with with our migrations. My experience has been the first. It's it's like a twelve step program. The first mm -hmm. step is admitting you have a problem with the ORM, mm -hmm. and until they have until they admit it, you're not going to have very much uh, headway in getting a switch. But once they admit it, now they're open, and now now there's a chance to let's find the way to minimize the amount of pain that it takes to uh, get something that works well and doesn't have the problems that you have in this situation. Yep. And and it's not always going to be successful, right? Like like one client that we had, it was um it was a grocery store point of sale systems and it was like Cloud Azure and it was like sharded, you know, so they had a lot of their clients, I don't know if it was like a piggly wiggly, you know, so it was something southern grocery stores not large ones, right? So they were using this company's point of sale service and it was like this is just slow. It's got to be this section. So I came in and I'm like, "Well, I was like, okay, are you willing to just like, can I just take, you know, I just captured their query that they were trying to run and it was just a mess of nested everything's right. And it's like, right. okay, y'all, if you just took this and ran this here, or use like, you know, a different, you know, used, um, you know, a temp table to limit your results and, you know, all the, you know, things, all the best practices yeah, you stuff, say to tuning right. queries and stuff. And it's like, yeah, we don't want it. We want to do everything in ORM. I was like, okay, let me just do this. I will take what you have write the store, like write it as I would recommend you write it. And then if you can figure out a way how to reverse engineer the, like this query in ORM, then just go for it. But, you know, it, you know, it's like, you know, it's like generally crud. I don't care if it's create, read, update, delete, you could use an ORM. It's very basic. You know, there's not a lot of tuning. Anybody's ever going to have to probably do to those. Right. But it's like, once you start getting into your TPS reports or you're doing, you know, you know, your, your search queries and optional parameters, then you need to have it in a stored procedure. But, you know, it's not always going to be possible. There's people that's just like, I, I will get hives if I even say the word stored procedure or something. So <laughs> that was the best that I could do is just still try to find a win-win, right? It's just like, well, here's how sure. I would write what you're doing. And if you could figure out a way to do it with your ORM and, you know, um, and not have it messed up, then go for it. Did they figure it out? Or is that yeah. still? Yeah, they did figure it out. Oh, well, hey, well, there, there you go. I mean, so that that is, you know, uh, kind of a, a nifty little trick and perhaps outside of what our, our topic is. But, you know, that concept of, uh, well, here, you know, here's what the finish line should look like, right? Now, you know, go and create this, right? Then that that's powerful because at least it gives them something to, yeah. to baseline against, right, if you will. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, so very good. So on this, and I, sh I, I did mention at the beginning, uh, so sqlatorpartners.com slash crudgen uh, will be our show notes for today. You actually have a, a, a sort of YouTube videos, right, kind of walking through this um, and, and, and how people can, you know, get started and, and go over, you know, some of the processes. Um, and I feel like, I guess I'm just trying to think, um, I feel like it will be helpful for folks to check those pieces out. Um, but perhaps from a from a getting started perspective, um, it, so because I guess I, I again I started on the YouTube as well, right? So what are the, what are the first what are the first couple of steps that you might take besides watching a YouTube video to get started with this? Um. Yeah, I mean, yeah, after you watch the YouTube videos, I mean, they're really just going, I think, more more focusing on just the uh, just the search dynamic search because the others are, you know, a little That's bit true. more simplified. Um, like if 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 you just, you know, download the stored the stored procedure, put it into even if you want an adventure works or whatever you want to do, if you have 
you know, something that has, you know, you've written some stored procedures or something like that, like go ahead and just run it. You, you necessarily don't have to like, say you, if you pass in the parameter of say, create the stored procedure, it'll create the stored procedure with you. And if you, you know, it'll keep regenerating that. So if you're changing your schema, your table schema, it'll keep regenerating those stored procedures for you. Unless you remove like a tag up on top, it's in a comment that says like auto generated, then it'll keep it right. Um, like I would just generate, you know, SP CRUD gen and see what it's generating. And then, you know, if you've written stored procedures or just your CRUDs, just kind of take a peek and, and utilize it even as just a learning tool, right? Because there's only so much, you know, besides it's like, well, here is like a best practice of like, you know, like, do you want to output the results? Do you want to output all of the print, all the parameters you passed in, in, you know, a temp table and do an output, or do you want just you know, if you only want just the ID that's generated, just, you know, you can delete, just like you said earlier, you can delete, you know, parts that you don't want and then just keep like that new customer ID that gets returned back so that you can refresh like the user interface or redirect them to like a page where it'll load that. Um, you know, just go through and, and play with like the creates and the reads and the updates or something. And then just utilize that as just kind of a, a, a learning tool just to see like and compare what you've created just with what one person at one consulting company thinks as like what best practices are for create, read, update, upserts even. Um, you know, it even has some some really cool um, a delete stored procedure that you can put in how many you want to delete. So, you know, if you have, you know, millions of records that you need to clean up like once a month or once or whatever, if you don't have that that maintenance window where you can just you know, have a tape, you know, a table lock and just delete it and where that's going to be very fast. But if it's, if you're 24 seven, you got to do the looping through, you know, and, and do the little nibble bites. It's going to take a lot longer time, but you're not going to be blocking anybody else. So like there's, there's a delete kind of stored procedure in there that does that type of functionality. And even if you just see what it does and copy the parts of its functionality and create it yourself, it could be used as a pretty good learning tool also just to see you know, what, you know, I call us a senior level Microsoft triple gold partner, you know, of like what we do for software development and database development and how we build stuff. Right. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that, so, you know, it sounds like there's, you know, several, several pieces in there, right? Now, admittedly, so I was taking a peek at the, uh, the YouTube, but does it have its corresponding wiki page as well? Nope, I never built anything up for okay. that. Um, I probably could just have some some just generalized information, just stuff I found and stuff like that. That probably would be a good idea to think about in the future. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, so on GitHub, you can go there and at least see the, you know, download the pieces yep. and kind of see the, the, the notes there. Yep. Okay. I, I mean, just just the fact, like, and I think why that would be a good idea, like, let me just, like, talk about something else is, like, like these stored procedures, like the updates and deletes, like they even support like optimistic concurrency. You can pass in your row version timestamp column name. So whatever you call it, and it will like throw back a, you know, a print out a statement or whatever saying, hey, somebody else updated this record. So, you know, just the fact that, you know, it, it supports, you know, optimistic concurrency in some of these stored procedures that get generated. But it also does, you know, temporal tables. So system version temporal tables, it's it's aware of that. So if your table has that, you could pass in parameters of like as of and between and stuff and get back like and do some time travel queries in like that search stored procedure where there's things that probably aren't going to be called out anyway, anywhere except for like if you start watching a whole bunch of presentation videos I do, it might be better to have like a little kind of short snippet of just all the overall features and functionalities it can do. There you go. Very cool. So then you know, in this one as well, right? Um, so are you giving this now to your developers? Are you letting them, you know, yep. run with this for the most part? Yep. Yep. We are actively using it in software development projects right now. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, Kevin, Eugene, other thoughts? I think the the big thought I have is definitely some kind of page or some kind of wiki would would be helpful. I know you have some YouTube stuff, but I think 
the the big piece is the name makes it sound like it's like an ORM light at first, right? Sure. Like it, and what's interesting is a lot of the parts that are really neat about it are things that you wouldn't want to necessarily use an ORM for, right? Like you said, the basic CRUD, okay, that's fine. But whenever you start getting into search functions where it's really, really hard to optimize unless you're doing dynamic SQL for all the little combinations and stuff, you know, yeah. that's where it starts to get really, really interesting. So I, I definitely think something that shows off some basic kind of here's some of the things you could do could could really help with with understanding that. And and I've been told I suck at naming things and naming things is hard. So <laughs> it's, we, it's we were coming up with like tiers of our managed services and we had like platinum and gold and and I come I was like, well, okay, this other client wants something else. Should we call that lead? And and he just shook his head at me and he goes, yeah. you don't get to name anything anymore. We're not calling something the lead edition or the copper edition or something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, I, what, what's the joke? There's there's two difficult problems in our industry. There's uh, caching, naming things, and off by one errors. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, that, the, the biggest reason to use a password manager, in my mind, is that it would generate the password for you, right? I don't want to get like, oh, yeah. my gosh, I don't have to think about this stuff. Um, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so, we, Kevin, before we let you go, we do want to, we didn't do it uh, last episode, because we know that we knew that we were going to uh, double dip here uh, with you. But before we let you go, we would like to run through our SQL family questions. Is that okay? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so Kevin, how did you first get started with SQL Server? So I started at a pager company called Skytel when paging was really super cool. Um, so it was around Y2K. So I was a software development engineer building things with enterprise Java beans with web applications and shopping carts and paging gateways and stuff like that. So so during Y2K, I'm not even sure like what version it was. It could have been 2000. It was probably what 6.5 before that. So seven, yeah. Started doing that. So since then, pretty much my entire career has been focused in like software development, and every everything has been SQL Server. So about right. 15 years ago, um, one of the apps I was uh, developing, it was an agricultural commodity trading app, and it just started to get really slow. Second year, third year, fourth year. So I reached out to uh, uh, Brent Ozar at that time and mm. uh, paid, you know, the money and had, you know, came in and pretty much just found out I had no freaking clue. Like I thought I knew, you know, enough about SQL Server and databases and figured out that I knew nothing. So pretty much since 15 years, like I have been focusing on SQL Server and even though I've continued um, you know, if you look at my career progression, like I've been an IT director for pretty much the majority of my career, and I really didn't know that I could make as much cash being a consultant as I could. I mean, I should have probably just looked at Brent Ozar 15 years ago, but I focused and said, I'm, I just want to focus and go deep on SQL Server. So then that's when I went to, uh, you know, emergent software. So I've had a love of SQL Server ever since I figured out I didn't know what I thought I knew about it. Yeah, there you go. Well, in fairness to Brent, 15 years ago, he was, I mean, just, yeah, just a blogger. I mean, the, where, where he's yeah. come from then, yeah. right, is, is pretty amazing. Um, His tools were not not anywhere near the tools that that is open source now, but you did, he did give you some tools when, right. when you did have a project with him, oh. but they did not look anything like they are awesome compared to well, what oh, they started. Sure. sure, that's right. So you've uh, you hopped around a little bit, right? But you stayed in IT. What would you do if you had to change careers? So, like, if I couldn't go back, I, I and I and I'm taking that as like if I can't go back and become like you know some director, just IT or sysadmin type of job. Like That's I right. would, what I would love doing, I would love to be like a free range inventor, right? If if it was just like you know for these this quarter of the year, I'm developing a database tool or you know, then two or three months, I want to build a better alarm clock or something. And then like, I even have these ideas of building a type of like social web app and stuff like that. It's just, there's not enough time. There's not enough, you know, with okay. a family and having to have income, there's so much I want to do. So that's why I kind of say is 
a free range inventor where I could just do whatever I wanted to at different times of the year. That would be <laughs> awesome. Do you ever make it out to like to the consumer? Was it the consumer electronic show or whatever? The big Vega show? Yeah, or, see, yeah. I, see not, not that one, but um, like I've done all of like the local ones that we have up here in the Twin Cities and stuff. Okay, yeah, very cool. Yeah, I can, you know, it, it's just amazing uh, what you see there sometimes, right? Uh, yeah. Yep, anyway. absolutely. Yeah, so I can imagine that that, that would be, you, you'd, you'd have a good time there. <laughs> yep. Now, what's one thing that can instantly make your day better? Food. I, hmm. I I am one. I always say I live to eat instead of eat to live. And like my family and I, like we, you know, we're very close night uh, knit uh, knit uh, together. Like I have two adult daughters and my wife, and we all like games and everything. And we go out to eat and we go to different dining locations and stuff. So I'd say food is the thing that can that always makes my day better. There we go. Now, what's your go to song when you need to when you need to boost your mood? So it's a it's a little ditty called Hug a DBA by Killa DBA. <laughs> For, I don't uh, think so. He's, he's the one that did uh, what the sequel song? Bunch, yeah. Has he done a bunch? Done a bunch I haven't kept 2016, up with 2016, 2017. He hasn't done a 2022. I don't know if he did a 2019 or so, but um, he's done a lot kind of with yeah, the, the one that had it passed a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. He, Okay, yeah. so he's put out a hug a DBA. Interesting. I'll have to go take take, yeah, take a that peek. That bookmarked, so I just you, crank it up every every once in a while. Probably at least once a month, I'll crank it up, and my family just kind of looks at me a little sideways because they know I need a little go to song day. <laughs> there you go, man. That's that's funny. Um, okay, so uh, some people have them, right? Not everybody does. So I guess the question is, what do you have a bucket list? I I don't really, but I do have things that I would do. Um, okay, here we go. We farmed for about five years, and we raised a lot of different animals. Um, but if if I did it again, and we have been thinking now because my job is completely remote, we could move farther out into the country. We only have about five acres now, and I would move out, get you know twenty acres, and I would raise my own wagyu cattle. Oh, there we go. So we, all of a sudden, mm. Kevin wants to do a little sequel grilling in Minnesota, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we, we we would we would come for that, Kevin. Right? So you, you let us know how that goes, and uh, right, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll submit to that one. <laughs> there you go. Okay, our last question for you today, Kevin. What's your favorite ice cream topping? Um. Probably not topping, but like um, concrete mixer or blizzards. Um, so I like Reese's Pieces inside mm. my just vanilla custard or whatever. Um, those are my absolute favorite to get mixed in with everything. There we go. I like it. I like it. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Kevin Martin from Minnesota. Thank you for being on our our episode today, our, our podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So as always, compañeros, right? So uh, if you have feedback or other thoughts uh, for Kevin um, on the, uh, the either of the procedures that we've talked about these last two episodes, right? Uh, feel free to let them know. Reach out to us. We'd like to know if you if you start using it, um, we'd be interested in hearing that or have used it, right? Let us know uh, what's going on. And Kevin, if folks wants to reach out to you to give you some of that feedback, how can they reach you? You can go to my website, kevinmartin.tech. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and post on there. And I will, uh, if you connect with me, we can have message chats back and forth. I love chatting with people. Awesome. Mr. Eugene. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at SQL Gene. Hey, Mr. Kevin Fiedel. Uh You're going to have to create a dynamic SQL statement. And maybe you'll be able to get details from there. There you go. There's a flag in that crud gen, right? That you know, if you use the no, it got taken out for community standards. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. You might have to go to the previous version uh, to get it. To... <laughs> yeah. Look go. for the commit hash eight four six A C F. There we go. I feel like I should know uh, what that is, right? There's probably some code there, you know, but uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
go yeah. get us. Check you it. can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm at Carlos El Chacon. Uh, thanks again for uh, for tuning in to today's episode. Kevin, we appreciate you being here for your contributions to the community. Hopefully this gets a little more spotlight, right? And you get some more folks mm-hmm. using it because uh, it's always, um, you know, we, we like we like promoting stuff that can, uh, that can help the community. So thanks yeah. again for taking your time. And uh, uh, thanks to the folks at uh, Emergent for letting us uh, take a little bit. So absolutely. Okay, compañeros, thanks again. And we'll see you on the SQL Trail. Bye now. All right. Thanks. Bye. SQL Data Partners.